right, let's start. Um, so thank you all for joining. I'm very excited to have you all here. I think this is our fourth or fifth meetup, um, the version of the Hitchhiker's Guide 2. Um, today we're going to talk about Tech for Good, which is, um, I spoke to a few of you, like someone who works at the Red Cross, um, like everyone already seems to have some sort of connection um, to uh, doing more with their tech skills than just collecting a paycheck at the end of the month. Um, if not, then we have a few speakers who have beautiful examples. Uh, we're going to have three speakers today. Um, so we're starting off with Thais, um, who will tell you how to tinker your own like um, detection hardware um, uh, to uh, combat poaching. Um, then we have my colleague Tim from Listen Up, um, who will be um, giving a short talk about how he helps teachers in like, a very nice and pragmatic way. And then we'll close off with Jerry, um, who works on well-being software. Um, I do have a few announcements. Uh, one is there is a next talk already planned. It's on April 6th, and it's about accessibility in native apps, um, and it will be in Amsterdam. Um, and I've been told I've never been there, but the Amsterdam office is as cool as this one. So definitely do check that out as well. Um, and it will be mentioned on the meetup page. Um, if you want to stick around at the end for a beer, then please do up until the point where it gets awkward, um, or maybe just a little bit before. Uh, you're welcome to talk to the team and ask any questions. Uh, for the presentations, um, we're going to do qu a question round at the end of each presentation. Um, and um, if we do that, uh, we have a recording here, and we would like to really capture the audio, so someone's going to come to you with the mic uh, for asking your questions. And please don't let that hold you back from asking any questions. And then I think I've rambled on for uh, long enough, so I'm going to hand over the mic to Thais, and um, enjoy. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Thijs. I'm a nerd. I work at Q42 at this beautiful office every day. And uh, I think like a lot of you, I like technology and writing software. Is there anyone here in the audience that doesn't, is, is not involved with technology? Natalie? OK, not much. But the rest of, his, of them are. Well, I can assure you I'm not going to talk about technology too much. So um, I won't bore you to death. Um, my career in technology has taken me to some unexpected places in the past few years. And um, I've been on some adventures. And I want to take you on one of these adventures today. And this starts in the back of a Toyota Land Cruiser. It's a big 4x4, four four, and I'm there with my colleague Tim, and uh, all the special gear that we need for our adventure. I'm cramped up in the back of that truck, and as we leave the populated areas, the roads become worse and worse. There are these huge potholes in the ground. We, we uh, leave the city, and we hit one of those potholes, and I fly through the car, the back of that truck together with all my stuff, and I just hope it stays in one piece. The sky turns from blue to black as the sun sets. We drive along a dusty road, we go around a corner, and suddenly the driver slams on the brakes. We see a group of elephants cross, cross the road in front of us. For me, it's a magical moment to see these elephants in the wild. We continue our journey, and after 14 long hours in the back of that truck that were very uncomfortable, we finally arrive at our destination. The following morning, I wake up in the middle of the African rainforest. As far as the eye can see, there's nature untouched by humans. I'm in Gabon, and Gabon is a country in Africa and it's very important for forest elephants. In fact, it houses 70% of the global population of these animals, and it's their last safe haven. And I don't think it will be a surprise to you if I say that these elephants are endangered. One of the reasons that these elephants are endangered is pretty commonly known as poaching. 
It's where the elephants get killed for the ivory in their tusks. But there is uh, one other threat to elephants. And it's something that not many people know exists. And when we were in Gabon, we actually witnessed this threat. I have a small movie about that. So when we met these women, elephants had broken into their plantation and were now eating the food that these people need to rely on and you know, to rely for, for food for, for themselves and their kids. And you have to remember that this is a very remote place. We had to drive for 14 hours, so they just cannot go to the supermarket to get food. They cannot, cannot enter the plantation anymore because elephants are in there, and if you uh, go into the plantation, they might be charged. This is called the human-elephant conflict. And this is becoming a problem across the globe, more and more, where elephants and humans compete for, you know, habitable space and food. And in Gabon, scientists have found that due to climate change, the trees are producing less fruit every year. So what you get is hungry elephants, or should I say hangry elephants, because you can see it looking at the pictures, the elephants look very skinny. You can see their ribs and their hips sticking through their skin. They don't, don't look good, good at all. So they go look for sources of food where humans grow it. And they break into plantations and they, don't, they do not just you know, eat some bananas. No, they just destroy the banana trees. They push them over. So for the locals, this is a big problem because their plantation is now destroyed. And these are deadly conflicts. Like I said, it's not uncommon for elephants to charge and kill humans. And in retaliation, locals throw spears or use other weapons, sometimes killing elephants. Now, um, I have to be honest with you. Uh, before I started working on this project, I did not even know that human-elephant conflict was a thing. Even more so, I did not know that Gabon was a country in Africa. Who of you know, knew that Gabon was a country in Africa? Hands. I see some hands, yes. I've never heard of it before. What I did know as a pretty young kid when I was around 14 years old was uh, what I wanted to do uh, with my life. Um, I got my first computer or my dad bought my first computer uh, when I was around 13 years old, and uh, it was this luxurious tower with a double-speed CD-ROM player, player, and it was like top of the bill. It cost like 4,000 gulden back in the day. It was crazy expensive. And um, yeah, I basically took over that computer. Sorry, Dad. He never actually got to use it, and I still have to help him with like basic tasks, but it helped me set my, uh, my career. And it all started with um, one file. It, the file is called autoexec.bat. I want to see some hands of the people that know what this file is. I saw you nod. Yeah, Chris, you as well. Um, I think this audience will grow smaller and smaller uh, across time. But um, it was the way I learned to program. I just wanted to play games on my computer. And um, for the games to run, I had to uh, configure my, that file uh, to load drivers into the high memory, otherwise I couldn't play that game. And uh, I installed DOS. It came on uh, three uh, floppy disks. I had no clue what I was doing. And I was literally typing over the file that my neighbor printed out into, uh, into my own computer. And I was just writing these weird characters, go to this, go to that. And I clearly remember the moment where I, the penny dropped for me. And it was not go to, it was go to. And I jumped to another label in the code. And it was the first time that I saw the logic in a piece of code. And I never stopped since. I studied here in The Hague 
Um, and um, fast forward to when I was like 30 years old, uh, I was you know, being a software engineer for quite some time. By then I probably had written a million lines of code. And you know, I was having fun at my job, but something was missing. I didn't really know what, but something wasn't right. I just knew that I, if I stayed in my current position and I would wake up in 10 years, then you know, I wouldn't be happy. And it took me some time to figure out what that was. But for me, it was a lack of purpose, so to say. So I wanted to do more with my coding skills. I wanted to make sure that I got the most out of the lines of code that I typed. And this basically started small by thinking, how can I write the same piece of, how can I write the same feature in less code? But pretty soon I, I started to wonder, what if I can work on the bigger challenges of this world with my coding skills? And now I'm at Q42. Uh, I started working here, I think around eight, nine years ago. Years ago. And now I work at a small department called Hack the Planet. And Hack the Planet is the place where me and my colleague Tim get to spend our time on projects that uh, we get to spend our technical skills for good. And that is in the broadest sense of the word. Um, we are doing a variety of projects uh, at Hack the Planet. And I count myself lucky to be working at a company that is crazy enough to have two people working full-time on projects that do not make a profit. And I think Q42 is an example for a lot of other companies that you know, could uh, mean something in this space as well. And uh, to give you a, a small um, look into the kind of projects that we do, uh, for instance, last year we launched a online artwork to educate teenagers on the dangers of online sexual abuse. Now, this is a very heavy topic. And um, we basically built an online artwork that you can browse around. And you can discover victims of online sexual abuse sharing their story. And we did this uh, project for uh, Fonds Slachtofferhulp, which is an which is a, um, what is the Dutch word, the English word for stichting, an NGO for, uh, that helps victims. And um, the challenge was, how do we make something that teenagers are, are interested in, like intrinsically? So we built this interactive together with teenagers, and the name of that platform is actually the response that they had when we shared some stories of these victims with them. And their response was, what the fuck? And that is the name of the platform. And it is, it's, we, we co-created it with teenagers. And um, yeah, like I said, it's not something you wanna read up on when you have, wanna have a fun night. But we reached around 100,000 uh, teenagers with this platform, hoping that we help them towards uh, seeking help if they encountered similar uh, stories, if, if they're being, um, what is the, the word again, the um, sextortion. So if you send like nudes to your boyfriend and suddenly they're all over the school. A lot of the times people that do that don't feel a victim, but they think it's you know, their own fault. So this is a pretty heavy topic, but um, the, the projects that we have been working on most recently are in the conservation space. Um, so I want to take you back to Africa. And the idea for the project that we're working on and where we were in Gabon for was a smart camera trap. And this idea came to us when we were talking to rangers. Rangers are the people in national parks protecting elephants and rhinos. And they, they told us that they often work with camera traps. This is a camera trap. It's just something you can buy. And you strap it around a tree. And when there's motion in front of it, it takes a picture. And the rangers tell us that after like six months, they go to this camera trap. They collect the memory card. And then they can see what happened. So they can see there was an elephant here 10 weeks ago. 
Or there was a poacher here 12 weeks ago. And that's when we thought, well, wouldn't it be nice if you knew that immediately? You don't want to wait for that information for six months. And that's basically what we built. So um, we're all about you know, finding pragmatic ways to solve a problem. We don't want to be working on this for 10 years. So we took an existing camera trap, we opened it up, and we added some of our, existing har uh, some of our own hardware. And that hardware allows it to communicate to uh, this mini computer. This mini computer uh, can now wirelessly connect to the camera trap. It downloads the images from it. And then using this Raspberry Pi, we use a machine learning algorithm to automatically see what is on the photo. So is there a human or an elephant on the photo? And then came the hardest part because how do you relay that information to rangers if you're in a rainforest without 4G coverage or what, whatever communication? So we use this satellite modem on top to send that information through space directly to the phone of rangers. And now we created a camera trap system that sent information to rangers within minutes. And now they have real-time information of what's going on in their park. So they, they know where elephants are, but they also know where poachers might be active in their park. And this could be a game changer for them. And that is what we were in Gabon for, to test out this system. So we jump back into that four by four, and we drive to a small forest near a village that was suffering from human-elephant conflicts. Now, Tim and I had been working on this system for about a year, and we were pretty excited to be there. So we jump out outside of the truck, and we were making a lot of noise, and then the ranger is like, shh, and he listens. <laughs> and we hear him smell. And he explains to us that this forest is full of elephants. If we go in there making a lot of noise, we might surprise them. They might charge us. And they, these elephants will run through the forest like there is no forest. And I will probably stumble over the first twig I encounter. Um, I could feel the tension when I went into that piece of rainforest. Normally, I'm safe behind my keyboard. And now I'm here, could be, could be killed by an elephant. We head deeper into the forest. And the ranger is looking for an active elephant trail. He's looking at the bark of the trees because the elephants rub against it. And he's looking at the elephant dung, the elephant poop. And he's really uh, good at spotting which trails are active and not. We find a good place and we deploy our camera. I had configured the camera to send a notification to my colleague's phone whenever an elephant was spotted. We head back to our uh, to the place where we are staying, some small cottages in the middle, in the middle of the rainforest. And late at night, uh, it's hot, I cannot sleep yet, uh, there are mosquitoes buzzing around, and I start wondering, did I do everything correct? Are there no bugs in my code? Because if you deploy a website, if there's a bug, you can probably see it in some fancy dashboard and fix it but all my code was running on devices that were inaccessible. And then, suddenly, I hear some strange sounds through the thin wall beside me. Yes, there, there, is, there it is again. And it is the phone of my colleague going off. He is receiving some notifications. And the following morning, he confirms. He has gotten messages that our cameras have seen several elephants. But since we're using the satellite modem, we cannot send the actual image. It's too much data. We can only send 340 bytes uh, in a single message, which is not much. Um, so uh, we have reports of elephants, and we want to go back there to see if it's correct. So we drive back to that piece of forest, and this is what we see. Ah, that's, yeah. that's the eye. Yeah. It's, it's the eye of the elephant. Yeah. 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 Wow. Wow. 
Could it be that it's actually the elephants that are inside the fence now? Trois là, c'est sûr que c'est le groupe là. So, parce que ce sont trois là-bas. Oui, et on a fermé trois là-bas. Oui, trois ici. Oui, c'est c'est le même groupe. Ça fait le même groupe. By far, this has been the best moment of some code of mine, seeing that work in the wild. This proved that our technology worked. Not only that, but our cameras actually captured the very same group of elephants that had broken into the plantation of the local women that you saw before. So it also proved that this, this technology could provide valuable information for rangers, keeping you know, elephants and humans safe. When we were walking through the plantation, some hours later, um, we suddenly saw something in the middle of the fields. It was an oil drum. And we were asking the rangers, what is that oil drum for? There were some sticks lay laying on top of it. And they explained to us that if locals know elephants are approaching, they will go to that oil drum and they make a lot of noise, hoping that it will scare away the elephants, preventing them from breaking into the plantation. And in that moment, very moment, our next idea was born. Because we're nerds, we want to automate everything. So we thought, well, what if we can automate that? We have some smart camera traps that can detect elephants, but can we also automatically scare them away? Um, well, that's the, the next challenge we set out to do. And that's something that's lying here. We call it the elephant repeller. With this horn speaker, and a, le uh, a light that responds to our smart camera traps. And when an elephant walks past, this thing starts producing a lot of noise. Let's see if it works. Yes, it works. This might actually be something that we're playing in the middle of the rainforest in March. Because in March, we're going to Zambia to test two of these prototypes. One is laying right there uh, near uh, an uh, elephant orphanage uh, where they have problems with human elephant conflicts. And uh, there we hope to prove that this technology can uh, automatically scare away elephants. Now, um, I don't think that it will be a surprise to you if I say that there is enough going on in the world. We have climate change, plastic waste in the oceans, human elephant conflicts. There are probably a lot of challenges out there that I don't even know exists. And um, to be honest, if I talk to young people, or I see young people in the media, I'm inspired by how aware they are of these challenges, and um, how they're active working on, on, on these challenges. And looking, looking back on my own career, I'm sometimes ashamed that it took me so long to start thinking about this. But um, that reminds me of a Chinese quote, or what is the word? Gezegde? What is that in English? It's a saying. It's a Chinese saying that I read in a book recently. And it said, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The next best time is now. And that is what I'm actually here to do today, to try and plant a seed. Uh, I try to plant a seed in all of you. Um, and with this seed, I hope that you don't only think about what is it that I want to uh, work on, what kind of job do I want to do, what kind of technology do I want to try next. But I want you to think more about what kind of problems do I really want to solve? What do I want to leave behind? What do you think is really important, what does really matter, and why not go for that? Because 
it, I, I know it can be you know, hard to take on these challenges because you can be challenged by naysayers or maybe you're stopped by your own insecurities. I cannot do this. Or somebody else, else must already be fixing these crises. And to be honest, this is usually the first thing that we think if we come up with a new idea. The smart camera, the repeller, it's like stupid, simple ideas that we think this must already be existing, right? Somebody must already be working on this. But we have found that this is usually not the case. So you can go for that. And you know, my, my, my uh, assignment for you is plant that seed in a, in a place where you want to, come at, uh, to, to really come at your fruition. Because you know, the work that you do, the, the skills that you have, it's, it's a place where you spend the most of your time. So why not you know, go for the thing that really makes you feel good? Because I have learned that if you can use your skills to contribute to global challenges, really help people, really help animals, then that is by far the best feeling there is. Thank you. Any questions? Um, je had gezegd dat uh, de camera's uh, via satelliet uh, data kunnen versturen via 300 bytes of 300 megabyte? 340 bytes. Bytes, ja. Uh, als ik denk een beetje aan een conventionele foto, wat waarschijnlijk een JPEG formaat is als je dat verstuurt, die zijn al gauw iets van 1 megabyte. Dus hoe hebben jullie dat probleem opgelost? Ik ga ervan uit dat het iets van gesegmenteerd moet zijn of iets in die richting. Ja. Um. Just for the English speakers, uh, the question is, how do you send an image uh, in 340 bytes? And our, my answer is, we don't. So we do not send the image. We, um, we run the image through an image classification model, and then it spits out a bunch of metadata. So the date and time of the image, and the accuracy that it detected a human or an elephant, and we only send that metadata. Um, yeah, because it's impossible to send an image in 340 bytes, or at least it's possible, but it's like uh, an image of 10 by 10 pixels that you that is unusable. So um, we send enough metadata so that if the SD card is collected later on, you can still pair them up to the predictions of the machine learning model, so you can actually see, you know, when the model was correct and when when it was maybe incorrect, because that also happens. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. So yeah, yes, it does. Uh, well, then the second question follows up. Uh, it's a uh, which is probably just yeah, I'll repeat. My, uh, which is probably just like my knowledge about Raspberry Pi. But does the Pi actually have the computing power? Well, obviously, so because the version is just testing out there to compute uh, images and determine whether it's a uh, elephant, human, or uh, whatever. Yeah. So the question is, is a Raspberry Pi powerful enough to you know, recognize an image? Obviously it is, but it, it wasn't easy, I can tell you that. Uh, to be honest, I, I'm, not, I'm no machine learning expert. May, well, maybe a bit by now, but when I started this project, I was not. Uh, I started playing around with FastAI, which is a PyTorch uh, library uh, for um, training models. And this was you know, pretty nice. I got some good success with that. But uh, that didn't run on the Raspberry Pi. It took like 25 seconds for, uh, to classify a single image, and it crashed all the time. So then I moved to uh, TensorFlow Lite, which is a library from Google. And the Lite part is like a stripped, dumbed-down version of a model. Uh, that is actually pretty fast on Raspberry Pi. Inference time is like 100 milliseconds. And our model is a bit over 90% accurate uh, on predicting elephants or humans. Any other questions? All the way on top there. Yeah. 
So the question is how much effort went into the whole machine learning process. Um, not the largest part, because the hardest part is the hardware. I've learned why hardware is called hardware. <laughs> not because it is hard, but because it's damn hard to develop hardware. Um, uh, but we did spend some time on it. We worked together with the University of Stirling uh, for that, and they had a pretty large data set of 1.6 million images of all kinds of animals in the rainforest, and a part of that was elephants. Uh, so uh, we trained a model based on you know, the work that they put in building up this uh, model. We actually ended up using AutoML, which is a service from Google where you just upload your data set and it spits out the model. But it, you know, it took us some time to get there. Yeah, for that project, yeah. yes. For other projects, no. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, what kind of tech sca stack does HectoPlanet ex uh, like, uh, be an expert in? Mm, I think my answer is, we're not an expert in any stack, and we do like everything a little bit. Uh, some projects uh, involve VR, so we also did a project uh, to combat loneliness for among elderly peop people. We built a VR application for that. Like the what the fuck uh, platform is a web application, um, and but the conservation projects they do involve hardware, and we work together with. Oh, oh my God, it's going off again. <laughs> um, so the conservation projects do involve a lot of hardware, and we work together with companies that are specialized in hardware development. Uh, we don't do that ourselves entirely. Yeah. It, it, to be honest, um, I've been working as a software engineer for over 20 years. And since joining Hack the Planet, I, every day I feel like that 12-year-old boy that was typing over the, that file from his neighbor. I, I have no clue what I'm doing. Each and every day I'm... Then I'm writing C++ code, and then I'm you know, learning how to train a model. And then our focus is, again, maybe I'm just inspired by my younger self, but my, our focus is we want to solve a particular problem. That is our laser focus. And we just you know, try to do whatever is needed to get that job done. And you know, if it involves hardware, it involves hardware. And if it involves virtual reality stuff, then you know, let's go for it. Yeah. Sorry, you're next. So, yeah, I can also speak up loud. So, basically, what's next for this, this device? Because of I can imagine a lot of use cases, like the Brazilian deforestation, for example. Yeah. That's a great use case. Can you try to sell this to someone or like put it forward and try to solve as many problems as you can with it? Yeah. So, so the question is what's next? How much time do we have for questions? Okay, so so other questions will will be with a beer in my hand after all the talks, but uh, you know I will stay here. Um, what's next? Yes, um, so uh, in March we're going to Zambia to test out the elephant repellers, um, but we're also going to Zimbabwe in March to test our cell phone sensors. It's something I haven't talked about tonight, but we also created a piece of hardware that can detect cell phones in remote areas because poachers always have so cell phones with them. Uh, so uh, these two projects are, is something we're focusing on currently. And then in June, we're going to Romania to do a project to use this technology to scare away bears. Uh, so I've been busy training a model to detect bears. Uh, that was quite a, quite a challenge, actually much more a challenge than elephants. Um, 
And yeah, we're always looking for, you know, other parks to roll out. We're quite busy in the upcoming months, but um, uh, usually we, you know, try to reach out to other parks, organizations or parks contact us uh, if they're interested. And somehow this keeps us busy. Yeah. So, sorry. My, my, my question was similar. Okay, cool. Well, any other questions? after the beers or during beers, and then we're up to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Nice one, very inspiring. Um, so I think Tim is, we're gonna continue with the next talk right away. Um, so Tim, if you're ready, uh, please do set up. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like I said already three times, if you wanna know whether um, bears are repelled by the same songs as elephants, then uh, speak to Thais afterwards. Um, <laughs> All right. All right. Um, there's actually, for Tim's presentation, we have one assignment for you. Um, you could already, because uh, we make interactive presentation software, so we use it whenever we do presentations at Lesson Up. So if anyone, everyone can grab their phones, actually, um, and head to the website lessonup.app, um, and soon we'll have a code on the screen um, that during the presentation will allow you to join in into some, um, yeah, answer some questions and give some input. Thanks. This one? I need my speaker. I think so. Ah, yeah. right. Okay. Okay. I cool. okay. um, think I'm ready. I feel a little bit blown away by Thijs's presentation, so good job, Thijs. But uh, um, my presentation will have a similar uh, goal as I wanted to also talk about using tech for good. For me, my match was education, and that is why, uh, where I want to talk about today. Um, the URL you can see now, lessonup.app, but it will be shown later as well. Who am I? I am Tim. I am a tech lead at LessonUp currently. I have been with LessonUp for seven years, so way from the beginning. And I was very late to the game of programming. Uh, I will uh, talk about why that is interesting later. But it is, does follow a similar passion-driven thing like Thijs. So what I want to talk about, what is LessonUp? The very quick version, uh, how I ended up there, uh, being uh, using tech or being a techie for good, and some examples how you can uh, have a really big effect as a techie with very small improvements. So lesson up. You are looking at it. So you have a rough idea what lesson up is. Uh, lesson up is an uh, uh, educational, soft, uh, educational software. Uh, it's a slide deck with interactive elements. So our official slogan, because of course, uh, I look up the marketing website and it's copy paste because that's what marketing expects me to do. Make every class better than the last. Uh, and create more engaging, joyful and effective lessons with our intuitive toolkit for teachers and online lesson library. But it's PowerPoint on steroids, like our founder normally says. And it makes lessons way more enjoyable for students in the classroom and more effective in a lot of cases as well. More about LessonUp. Uh, we are a scale-up based here in Apollo as well. We are just one floor up. Uh, we, are, we started with four people. Uh, now we are, I think, 38. I just heard from Paula. Uh, for the techies, it's always uh, fun to see some stats about how active it is being used and what uh, kind of issues you are having because of that. We have 35,000 weekly active teachers, and they bring with them more uh, 10,000 or more, 100,000 or more students. We actually don't really know how many are weekly active because we try not to track our students too much because of GDPR and uh, things. Uh, the most of them are minors, so uh, no tracking in the student application. But there are a lot. Uh, now I have some interactivity because, of course, I have to show the platform. The, you have already the URL, and the pin code is 924 and uh, uh, 67. Four.
the pin code will stay in the bottom corner if you still haven't filled it out. But I wanted to show you one of the first things we developed. This actually was a thing we, sh we did not think of ourselves, but we just copied another platform, but it's still an awesome feature. Uh, this is a mind map. So what do you think about when I say high school, enter one word, press enter, enter another word, press enter. I think most of you get the idea, and I see we already have a few matches. I will close the responses and see what you come up with. Nice, the most, uh, most of you think of friends. That's a good, uh, good memory. Uh, some think of learning, some of exams. A few think of boring, homework, classes moving too slow or too fast. Uh, someone thinks of lesson up, that is good, but it's probably one of my colleagues, I think. Um, <laughs> Movies, who thinks of movies during uh, school? Is watching on your phone while a teacher is talking or uh, watching in front of the class? Anna, I can see your name. Why do you think of movies? <laughs> uh, high school movies, okay, of course. Um, but I see quite a few boring, uninteresting, uh, those kind of answers, the answers I actually sort of expected, and the answers, the thing we are trying to solve with Lesson Up. Um, so next one is a poll. I would have enjoyed more digital interactivity in the classroom. Digital is within parentheses, of course, because there are more types of interacti interaction. I think I will just continue. Ah, nice. This is also what I hoped, uh, hoped to, uh, that you would answer. Yes. But there are 14 colleagues. Yeah, no, they're not 14 <laughs> colleagues. Uh, there are slightly less. <laughs> so some of you at least answered this. And uh, for the people who hate being singled out, we do not show names by default. But of course, I can still sing you out if I want to. <laughs> <laughs> But I will not make you say anything in front of the class. I'm not that kind of person. Um, but you get the idea what lesson up is. Uh, I wanted to show you these kind of these two examples. And um, now a little bit of how I ended up here uh, at lesson up. I told you I was late to the game of programming. I studied sociology uh, in university. Then I started working from a nonprofit who uh, uh, thought about how the political system worked in the Netherlands. I also worked there as a student. And there, I, uh, when I was a tour guide, there I learned that programming can have a very big effect with a lot of very little effort. Because I replaced uh, the whiteboard that was being used by me and 30 of my colleagues daily or weekly with clickable interactive demos about how the, uh, the, the second chamber looks and who the mini ministers are. Well, there were written on the board previously, and I thought, this is nice. I was, think, I was, I think, 24 when I learned my first line of JavaScript, and I thought, oh, I can do this. Maybe I want to do this full time. And that is what I started thinking, and then I started working for a nonprofit uh, part time next to my regular job, one day in a week, for like, yeah, way too little pay, but I wanted to learn to program. So I spent 28 hours on my regular job and then the uh, one and a half days on my new programming job. And there I met, uh, the, then uh, there I met Kars, Kars is our founder. And I had this idea, I really like programming and I think uh, I can do a lot of good with it. 
but I also like education. I spend a lot of time in front of students, trying to teach them how the parliament works and how the politics work. So I wanted to do something with that match. To, that is my, was my idea for using tech for good, improve education by tech. And then I was there at the NPO, which is the, the Dutch Broadcasting Agency, and Cars was there, and he was speaking that they just launched their new, or wanted to launch their new platform, and they hacked the uh, school TV video player that is uh, a TV for uh, primary schools, and they reverse engineered it so they could embed it in their new platform. And I thought, because they could improve education and bring the internet into the classroom, and I thought, there, what happens? Ooh. There is, that, that, is where, uh, that is where I want to work. So I said, uh, I want to work for you. And he says, uh, okay. <laughs> that, and then it was like, there, were, there were a few months and some coffee and some other steps involved. But they hate it. something is broken. And some other steps involved, but in the end, uh, it all worked out. And uh, a few months later, I started working at LessonUp uh, as the first employee while there wasn't really a company yet. It was like three people uh, with an idea and a lot of challenges to solve. But I did find my match of education and code that I, that I really wanted and was searching for. And um, so I found my job. I am now a techie for good. Uh, well, now what? How do you start to solve the educational thing that you wanted to solve? Um, and now I think becomes the main rule of I think most SaaS platformers, but also from um, any platform really, know your user. At first, all 50. We knew all our 50 users. We, we talked to them daily. Uh, we asked, uh, uh, what are you, what are you uh, doing? What are the problems you're facing? How can we help you? And um, you have to leave your tech layer. If you try to invent a platform or an idea or a concept all by yourself in your small little tech layer, you will probably fail. It sounds, uh, sounds horrible, but you will probably fail. You have to know, get it out to the world, preferably to Africa, but uh, you can also just go to uh, Scheveningen, it's also fine. And get to know your users, get to know what problems they have and uh, extrapolate these users, uh, those problems and make them better um, and see if you can fix it for your whole user base or for your future users as well. So get out. Even as a techie, you have to get out, talk to people. I know it's horrible. Um, so now I have some examples how uh, talking to people, sitting in behind the classroom uh, uh, being out in the world with small example, small things, we really improve the life of our teachers. This is a, a, one of my first cases. Most of the cases will seem like obvious or boring, or yeah, ever, anyone could have think, thought of that. But it, like Thay said, really not the case. Someone has to think of it first, and then it seems obvious in hindsight. This is one thing that actually is one of the most used components in LessonUp. It's a timer. It's really just a stopwatch. You can put it on the screen. You can uh, fill out the time when you create a lesson, and you can start it, and it will, sp it will play. And teachers can say, now do your homework. Uh, take out your uh, workbook and do the assignment by yourself. This saved a lot of teachers a lot of hassle, and it was very fun to make, and also done in like one or two days. So this is the first main uh, takeaway, see our users in action. Uh, I found, and I think my colleagues found as well, sitting, behind, uh, sitting in the back of the classroom, extremely beneficial. And I think for most things and concepts you're trying to think of or trying to invent, the same idea goes. Of course, there is, there is not a classroom in most cases, but see your users in action and see how you can solve their real problems they're having now dealing with your platform, or even without uh, using your platform, see if you can encompass that, their problems, and make it your own, and try to solve it for them. Uh, sitting in the back of the classroom and just seeing what happens helps a lot. Case two, the spinner. 
also something that looks like obvious in hindsight, but when you're doing a, a presentation in front of a group of people, sometimes you still have to single out. Yeah, I know some of you don't want to be singled out. Sometimes you still want, have to want to single out a person and make them do something. And if you try to do that as a teacher by yourself, it's always unfair. So what is fair? Randomness. Because everyone enjoys randomness and everyone thinks it's fair. So what we have now, who can tell a joke? Who of you wants to tell a joke? No one, right? <laughs> Let the spinner decide. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Do you want to tell a joke, Thijs? I'm horrible at jokes. <laughs> okay, I'll let it pass. <laughs> But you get the idea, a small, a small innovation that can really save teachers time and hassle dealing with their students and their classical interaction. Then another thing that I learned that is extremely beneficial uh, to learn from as a techie, while you probably don't really want to do it, do the beginner, if there is a beginner course, because we, uh, we went to schools and do the, to do the beginner course, do it yourself. Don't send the sales team, don't send the marketing team if there is any, do it yourself, and you will see everywhere you failed, in your onboarding, in your UI, in all the things you could improve. Even the registration process is probably way more tedious than you thought. Uh, then the onboarding is unclear. Then uh, Yoko, Yoko, who's 60, can't really find the button to teach while you think it's like this big and in a corner. So there's a lot to improve. If there is a, a, a way of seeing users interact with your platform the first time, use it and uh, learn from it and see it in action. Then another case that really helped a lot of teachers, I think this is a feature launched way too late. I think we only have it now for one and a half years. And I think it's already saved uh, 10,000 of cumulative hours or more in the Dutch educational system of not waiting on that one lazy ass student that is still not has, has, has answered his question. I didn't want to use it uh, before with the poll because I didn't, I didn't want to spoil myself. But uh, this is one of the features that teachers really thanked us uh, after implementing it uh, later so that they were really missing this all this time. And actually, I think maybe one or two ever asked for it, but at one point they just, why, why don't we have this? And uh, talking to teachers, think, no, oh, this could help. And this is very small, again, very small, but a very big improvement in the life of your user, of the students as well, because there's way less waiting time involved in, uh, in the class. And then uh, another thing is ask questions and anticipate. Uh, you really have to talk to the people that have having problems, to the problem you want to fix. Talk to the poachers, talk to the women in the villages if you have to go to Africa, or talk to the teachers. And really try to listen and do not listen to the solutions they are pr proposing themselves because a lot of the time they are proposing a solution for their problem, and their problem is very specific and very narrow. And if you think a little bit bigger and check with some other people as well, you can really uh, make the solution way better than if you just implement blindly the feature request you got from that single one user. You can improve the, everyone's life by anticipating and asking questions and talking with people. And in the last case, something we saw a lot of teachers uh, having trouble with sitting behind the classroom. Video is a very good asset to be used, but uh, getting people to not fall asleep with especially a quite long or instructional video, because you have to watch those in, the, in high school. So it has, there's no watching of cartoons and other kinds of stuff. It helps to stop the video halfway through and let people interact uh, with that video, with the, with the tools you already have. So now you can have uh, a live demo of the video question, and I hope that it's the audio thing correct. Okay, children, let's start the day with a few new math problems. What is five times two? What is five times two?
And now you, you can see it in action. We are waiting on these slow pokes. <laughs> Okay, let's just continue. I think, uh, I think most people should know the answer. <laughs> and yes, you can all do five times two. Awesome. And don't be shy, just give it your best shot. Yes, Clyde. 12. Okay, now let's try to get an answer from someone who's not a complete retard. Anyone? <laughs> Okay, don't be that teacher, but uh, <laughs> this was the idea of the interactive video, at least. Um, now, uh, uh, for the conclusions, uh, to try to maximize your goodness, I, as I called it, it's a horrible term, but I couldn't think of a better one. Uh, find a topic that is clo close to your heart, of course. For me, it's education. I really enjoy improving that, but I think it's different for everyone. So find a topic that is close to your heart. Stay in touch with the users. If you can, stimulate your team to do the same, because a lot of people do not want to leave their tech layer. And you can be the difference in making them leave their tech layer and making sure that they do interact with those users, because they will see new solutions that you haven't thought of. Um, and small improvements, like I showed you, of course, we have very big monthly spanning new projects but I showed you small, very small features that can all be implemented in a day or two, or slightly, the video was slightly more, uh, but they can make a world of difference in the direct uh, life of your user. And for, in our case, in the education now of 100,000 of students weekly. So uh, like the slowpoke feature, it really saves a lot of time. So try to maximize your goodness in a positive way. This was uh, the end, of course, because it is lesson up. If you have any questions, you can send them here. All remarks are fine as well. You can also just ask it with the microphone. You think it's a lot of typing, but uh, if people want to type, they are allowed to type. <laughs> Um, because I, uh, I was wondering how much did you also look into different learning styles because like those features as like uh, I can totally under see the, the point of like speeding up people like there are people that not pay attention but what like and now you're asking like simple question of five times two for example but what if there is like you're also still learning so I'm really wondering how you address the different learning styles in the room from uh, students um, we have uh, a colleague that is called Jan Walter. He is awesome. He has a very big beard, and he was uh, he is the uh, a decorated teacher, um, and he helps us create better tools. But in the end, it's up to the teacher to make sure that uh, their lessons include the correct things. We have a toolkit. We are not. Uh, we try not to be for the content, but we try to have the toolkit that does, does make sure that teachers can use all the tools that they need. So there's audio, video, uh, there's uh, images. Uh, teachers can share the lesson after they are done teaching with their students to go over it in their own time, because not everyone is uh, on the same pace. It can be slower, so everything can be shared and reviewed afterwards by the students. But in the end, it's we are trying to empower the teacher to give better lessons and help them, but it's up to them to incorporate the learning styles. Although uh, I understood from Jan Walter that all the learning style things is mumbo jumbo and it's uh, all backwards knowledge and uh, that it's not hip anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you.
Yes, uh, I tr will try to give a very short summary. Uh, uh, the question is, what are you doing to not uh, uh, make sure that you pressure kids, I think, into uh, uh, being on a timer in your platform? And um, yeah, uh, yeah, we can't really, because it's up to the teacher for a big part. What we are doing is that we uh, try to like I showed you with the poll, we, we do not show the names of the people who had the wrong answer. Uh, we hide your name at first everywhere. So we try to be as mindful of the students that are, might, be, might be giving wrong answers, might be uh, too slow. Uh, and the, the, I, I call it the slowpoke feature for fun, but it's of course not how we communicate it uh, to our teachers and to our students. Um, but yeah, there is, there will be some pressure in the classroom for students to join in. And in the end, I think it's a net positive. Uh, although there is probably also, uh, there can be for some students, probably some, some negative pressure. Uh, yeah, that's I think the answer I can give you. Yes. Uh, how much does it cost to keep a real-time functioning app running, approximately? Um, depends, actually. What do, you, what, do you, what do you want to factor in? I think for LessonUp, uh, our main cost is all the people here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Host, hosting a platform like this isn't that expensive, actually. It is the people, it is the, uh, the 38 people that want to have uh, uh, every month want to have a house and food. Uh, those are your main concerns. So no, I think our hosting costs are, yeah, they are dwarfed by our uh, people cost, I think. So it's not that expensive. I can't give you an exact number, but I know that the people are way more expensive. We are using uh, Google, uh, the Google Cloud uh, solutions, everything in Kubernetes, and we try to be as uh, lean and mean as possible. And then, uh, are there features that aim for less screen time for students? Good question. Uh, I know there's a current debate of banning the smartphones in schools altogether. Uh, we as LessonUp aren't actually fan of using smartphones for LessonUp. It is all smartphone accessible and doable. Uh, but we try to, if schools ask, we say use tablets and iPads when you need them and then put them away when you don't need them. Uh, that is the advice that we give. But we are a screen-based application, so no, we do not actively try to uh, reduce screen time for students. Uh, we think that the screens can really help create a, uh, a, a better interaction that has more students joining in than the classical old system where it's always Thijs putting up his finger. Um, and so, no, wait, no, we don't have that. Any more questions? Oh, oh you just use a finger, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, representation, really, really interesting. I was wondering if you, what kind of uh, analytics you show to the teachers. Like if you analyze like the, I don't know, what answer were mostly wrong and maybe like, I guess this is like quite a free use tool, but like with some standardization and some kind of questions, then you can even aggregate the results across different like classes and different schools. And in that, that case can also be done in a way that is compatible with GDPR because you don't get individual level. Um, our teachers, really are not looking for that kind of data. You would think uh, we techies like that kind of data. Uh, we love it. I think some of our school leaders would also like it. Our teachers really, they are not missing. They want to see if uh, the student is paying attention, 
if he is uh, uh, active, if he's not skipping out, and if he is roughly doing good enough. So that is the data we are presenting to our teachers. So we do not do aggregations. And there's also, you say that you can do it without any risk for GDPR, but if you try to do that in a way that you show it to teachers or to the headmaster or something, there are some privacy concerns. So we rather not go there. So we try to avoid that for as long uh, as possible, unless we find a way that we think we can do this ethically and neatly. But currently we just show uh, the student answered the question with this answer and the answer was correct or not according to your own data model. That is the only thing we are showing the teachers. And uh, the percentage of uh, that the students did of their homework in, uh, in their time and, if, and what the correctness was of their homework but nothing more than that. And it's actually enough for our teachers, so. And there more questions at the bar? Did yes, more know? questions at the bar, <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right, thank you, Tim. All right, um, I think we'll move on straight away with our last speaker, so that's Jerry. So if you want to go set up, um, I hope. Should we switch to the other converter? Because we had some issues just now. Yeah. All right, um, and then so we'll have one more presentation um, and a question round, and then uh, yeah, like mentioned before, I think all of the speakers will still be there, so you can ask them more questions um, uh, at the bar. Um, and there are a few more like lesson up colleagues that are marked by obvious rockets, and some Q42 colleagues if you want to uh, ask them about anything else. And then I'll hand over the mic to you. So um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Jerry van Swen. I'm uh, originally from The Hague, but uh, now I come all the way from Zoetermeer. <laughs> and uh, I work uh, for Quan. And uh, Quan, uh, as Pam, so this is our slo current slogan. And uh, what uh, we're dealing with is well being within teams and uh, especially within uh, uh, corporations. And uh, I want to tell you about my journey as why I joined one. But first, I want to tell you about what Quan does. Uh, we're uh, actually a company based in The Hague, so we're based in The Hague Tech. Uh, and but our team is globally. So uh, or all, uh, all my uh, co-workers are spread around the world. Um, so. Well-being is a topic that's, uh, be, uh, that's getting important uh, every, m more and more every year. And uh, that's uh, what our CEOs uh, came up with. So what um, the, the ori it is originated with our CEO that saw the, uh, the opportunity where there was, uh, uh, there need to be improvement within companies and teams uh, for the well-being, what uh, she saw. And so it started out with workshops that she uh, uh, gave for uh, companies and teams. And um, then she met our other CEO, which uh, had a product background. And she told her, OK, so what you're telling me is a product. And we can make this into a product. So that's how, it's, uh, that's how uh, is what Quan uh, started. Um, so. Uh, most productive teams um, are uh, 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 are teams that place an emphasis on well-being. So what that uh, entails is when uh, a team or a company uh, makes a priority of uh, well-being, then you see the the, the upside to that, and uh, that's something we uh, want to measure. Um, so this is also true. So with uh, uh, well-being uh, uh, being prioritized, uh, there's better uh, collaboration and um, more productive uh, uh, productiveness in teams. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, and th this, these are the numbers that we uh, currently uh, see. So with uh, the with teams uh, playing well-being at uh, the core of their uh, 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 at the core, uh, they see a massive improvements um, and five times more uh, likely to to advocate uh, 
their employers at the place of the work. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, so this, this, we see these improvements. So why is well-being so important? So the cost of losing an employer is 150% uh, of their salary. So what currently is happening is when we got uh, through the pandemic, uh, there was like a, a major um, uh, a, a movement where people left their companies and that led to uh, companies looking for more uh, uh, employers, uh, employees. And uh, that uh, 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 costs a lot of money. So about 150% of their salary. Um, so, and we also see uh, work-related stress is on the rise. So uh, about 78% of uh, employees say that their that stress negatively impacts their work. And uh, that's not good. And that's something we uh, see on a daily basis, uh, where we uh, uh, interview people, and that's uh, something we want to uh, uh, solve with our uh, uh, project. Um, so what if you could objectively uh, measure and well-being, what would be the impact? And that's something what we uh, ask ourselves. So that's where uh, Cron is introduced, and we're the only science-based uh, uh, science platform to measure um, and improve team well-being. So how do we do that? How do we measure that? And uh, how do we make sure that uh, that maintains? So we, we uh, created a framework uh, for uh, teams to um, uh, follow where what it actually entails is what I'll show you that in a couple of sli a slides, uh, but uh, we created a framework where teams need to answer questions on a, 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 a periodical uh, basis uh, uh, to see uh, what uh, uh, possible problems lie within the teams. And that's something they can then discuss. Um, so we are data driven. And um, what, what we see is uh, every three months, uh, we will uh, ask uh, teams or employees uh, uh, within the team to answer uh, questions. And based on those uh, questions, we get uh, results. And uh, we uh, can then see and discuss, uh, let them discuss uh, what possible problems lie within the team. And uh, uh, our goal is that the, um, these problems are not part of, uh, or not uh, the, um, um, uh, it's not something that HR should uh, solve, but it's something that the teams themselves should solve by uh, discussing that among uh, themselves. So uh, we're based on science, so uh, that's something uh, uh, I always get a question about is why of how are you based on science? What's the science uh, behind it? And so uh, our team is divided between uh, developers and uh, we get uh, a psych uh, psychologists and uh, HR uh, uh, based people in our team. And um, uh, we work with uh, King's College and uh, they are, uh, uh, yeah, they, they uh, are researching the well, well being and in teams and uh, in organizations. Uh, how it works. So, <clears throat> what we provide is a platform where uh, uh, teams can uh, answer questions, and what they do is they uh, go through uh, an assessment with uh, questions, and based on that, we can see the results, and they can see the results uh, themselves. And uh, the what we do is we ask questions based on mind-body uh, meaning, social connectedness and uh, self-fulfillment. 
And uh, uh, based on that, we you can also see the, your own your uh, personal result. Uh, so here you can see the dashboard, and uh, once you fill out all your answers, you can see all these numbers. And this is uh, for most of the engineers here. It's really interesting to see your own results, as where uh, uh, some um, um, uh, improvement can be uh, found. Uh, so these are the results uh, of an organization, but there are also uh, results for a team and for yourself. And so you can either improve uh, by yourself or you can uh, uh, improve as a team or as an organization. And based on the uh, results, uh, every three months, uh, we will ask uh, teams uh, to help, uh, to help uh, uh, retros, which are like meetings uh, with a whole team uh, where they can discuss uh, uh, what uh, what they can improve uh, based uh, for their well-being and then they can take action uh, which is literally uh, picking one of the actions that we provide or either uh, you can as a team can provide as well uh, for instance, if there's sleep dep uh, deprecation within the team, they can all uh, together uh, select that as an action where you can improve on that. And uh, you can uh, also maintain or uh, you can encourage each other to, uh, to solve that. Okay, so don't take uh, our word of, uh, for it, uh, because uh, currently uh, Quan is used by 200 teams uh, across 30 customers, uh, and uh, we went to a Y Combinator. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're still building, and, but uh, it's uh, currently already uh, used by a lot of teams. Uh, and what we also see is that teams uh, working with Quan are seeing improvements from 10 to 60% uh, uh, in key, key indicators, such as decrease in stress, burnout, and uh, increase in work-life balance. So those are the numbers that we actually see within our, uh, uh, our data. And that's really interesting uh, to see what uh, kind of impact it has building the software for people that actually use this and uh, improve on these key features. So, a couple of uh, testimonials from our customers. Um, but my role. <clears throat> so, uh, I started out as full stack developer uh, within uh, Quan, uh, and I eventually moved into the head of engineering uh, role. And uh, my daily uh, started out as just uh, developing day to day, uh, and eventually now I'm uh, 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 I'm managing a team of uh, people uh, of developers uh, that are uh, based globally, so worldwide. And why I uh, choose to work for Quan is before I joined Quan, I uh, worked as a freelance developer. And um, my uh, clients were uh, broad. So there were in all kinds of uh, um, sectors. And I worked previously, before Quan, I worked for uh, Groendes. That's a company uh, that's uh, uh, working in the green energy uh, sector. And uh, someone asked ask me before uh, I joined Quan is why do you choose to work for these kinds of companies that try to make impact in their sector? And that's not, not something I thought about before joining Quan. And uh, it made me think uh, why I spent uh, time uh, on those kinds of companies. And uh, uh, eventually led to me that uh, 
the skills that you use or the skills that you have, uh, you can uh, put them uh, for good work. And uh, it's good to uh, spend your time, your, your time that you're working, uh, on something that you stand uh, uh, by. Uh, because it's not, uh, uh, it, it's not nothing. It's uh, a lot of time of your uh, life that you spend on, on work. So uh, it's good uh, to make sure that what you're working on is uh, good for you, for it, it, it matches with your values. So uh, you can do this too. And I know a lot of people here uh, have a unique uh, set of skills that they can, they can use for good. So uh, think about uh, what you want to do with uh, either your time to make impact um, and uh, do what you want uh, to do. Any questions? Are you using Plan yourself? Yes, okay. Uh, this is something I didn't uh, explain. We're dog fooding, yes, that's the term. <laughs> uh, we are using it uh, ourselves and uh, we do that uh, yeah, regularly, so... Uh, um, yeah, and, and that's how we uh, eventually test our platform as well. But uh, yes, we do. Yeah. It's really interesting. So um, before I joined Quan, I didn't have any uh, experience with HR or uh, the psychology uh, or uh, business psych psychology, and I learned a lot uh, since I joined Quan. So take that uh, as may, but uh, you, if you uh, choose a company to work uh, for, you can also take that in mind, is to, that you can learn about something that you didn't know uh, before. Uh, any other questions? Oh, yes. You took, uh, sleep deprivation as an, uh, you took sleep deprivation as an example. I have a six month year old at home. <laughs> How will Quan fix that? <laughs> so, um, I don't think Quan can fix that. So, I, yes, <laughs> I have a two-year-old, so I know your pain. Um, no, that, that's something, but um, it's good for the rest of the team to know that. And um, that is also what uh, Quan wants to do, is to want to make that um, uh, visible. So for the rest of the team, that they, if you have sleep deprivation and nobody on the team knows that, then this tool allows it for something like that to be uh, visible. Uh, any other questions? Yes, that is a good question. Um, Sorry, can you repeat it? I guess yeah, so, okay, so the question was, um, uh, I'm currently out of engineering, looking for other developers or lo look for employees uh, to know if they also want to make that impact, impact uh, uh, through Quan. And uh, that's uh, um, hard to tell uh, from a resume but that's something you have to ask uh, during interviews. And then you know that uh, someone either has a uh, connection with uh, what uh, Quan uh, uh, wants to do uh, or not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course. Other questions? Uh, Thank you. Um, just one second. So there's more beer. Um, so feel free to take some, uh, take the opportunity to grab a drink, but also ask the speaker any other questions that you have. Like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, next meetup will be in Amsterdam on the 6th of April about accessibility in native apps. So be there, be square. And thanks all for coming and hope to see you soon again. Bye-bye.